Thank you very much, Mark. That was a good talk. Uh, I, I want to remind the audience that uh, please chat in your questions, and we're going to do our best to answer them. Uh, again, I'm going to introduce our group here. Uh, we have Dr. Ryan Fields, who's the Chief of Surgery at Moshu Seidman Cancer Center. Uh, we have Dr. Arndt Vogel, who's a hepatologist at the University of Hanover in Germany. My own colleague, uh, Dr. Christine Kang, the Associate Professor of Radiology at MD Anderson. Uh, Dr. Gonzalo Sapisochin, a very energetic transplant surgeon at University of Toronto and an assistant professor there. And uh, we have Dr. Greg Gors, uh, who is very, who's a really a senior translational scientist um, in uh, gastroenterology at the Mayo Clinic. So I'm going to request Dr. Vogel uh, to first go through some of the audience questions. Uh, but before we go there, I have a question for uh, Dr. Fields. Dr. Fields, you gave a very elegant talk on the nomenclature of, of hyalocholangiocarcinoma, and it's a little confusing. What is the difference between hyalur, perihyalur, flat skin tumor, extra cholangio? And as a surgeon, as a senior surgeon, is there any difference in terms of surgical approach to these various designations? Uh, I think um, what I the idea of being per se the six of us uh, of patients and we would all radiographic when we could you could use where we run into because the the an imprecise but um, you know our the strategy for so a telescopic negative mark and functioning liver remnant, obviously a liver important resectable with well, obviously risk logic outcome we all and so you know hyler hyler did the same thing at definitions that we you know, is this or extra hepatic? Is it potential can be confounding subject or treatment and targeted treatment? Thank you, Ryan. I think there was an audio issue here. I'm going to summarize what Ryan said. He, I think he mentioned use perihyler as the main term. And um, we'll come back to you, Ryan, <coughs> about the uh, Over to you, Arne. Yeah, so I think, thanks. Um, so we have a couple of questions from the audience and um, I think we have a lot of time. So please uh, send in your questions and we will discuss them here. Um, so the first questions we have here, uh, maybe we start with the uh, surgical treatment and one question maybe for Gonzalez would be, can you briefly outline the recurrence rate for um, after transplantation and also after resection? So what do we need to keep in mind? and so you already touched a little bit on it. How can we maybe in the future reduce the recurrence rate after surgery or transplantation? Yes, thank you, uh, Arndt. Uh, that, that's a, an important question. So, I mean, we know that after uh, surgery, the recurrence rate is, is, is pretty high and some series have, you know, defined even 80%. And I think one of the issues with surgery that we definitely um, find ourselves with is that sometimes achieving R0 resection is a challenge. And that's, I think, where the concept on on transplanting patients with de novo cholangiocarcinoma comes into place. I think on the surgical arena, you know, I think as a surgical oncologist and transplant surgeon, we you know we're all adamant to to work together with with you and and medical oncologists to try and find neoadjuvant therapies. I think that's maybe um, where the field is moving, and, and I think we need more research in that regard. And I think that it's what's likely going to make us reduce the recurrence rate. I think. You know, data from the Build Cup trial that some have adopted, but uh, you know, we we start we do treat patients after surgery uh, with ketamine, but obviously that's not enough. We know, all know that. So I think improving neoadjuvant and adjuvant uh, uh, therapies in this setting is important. Uh, after transplant, the recurrence rate you know reported again from the Mayo Clinic, which is the um, you know the main the team that has the largest volume, the disease-free survival at five years is around 65 to 70 percent, so around 30 percent recurrence. And again, I think even though we are treating these patients with 
appropriate neoadjuvant therapies, we still need better therapies. So I think systemic is going to be the way uh, to improve the, the five-year outcomes in terms of return. Yeah. yeah, I completely agree. And I think the field is indeed moving to the adjuvant and maybe even more to the neoadjuvant treatment. And maybe here one follow-up question to Milan. I think in pancreatic cancer, we have seen that clinical trials are possible. And it's good to hear that Gonzalo said that also the surgeons are ready for neoadjuvant strategies. Nevertheless, the outcome is a little bit not really disappointing, but we do not really see so far with the available chemotherapies such a breakthrough in terms of improvement of disease free survival or overall survival. So in, in binary tract cancer, do you think that we are already at a point that we can think about neoadjuvant concepts or do we need to wait for more effective chemotherapies? Well, I certainly think that we should. I mean, I'm going to let Ryan pitch in as well. I mean, I think we have learned from pancreas is that neoadjuvant therapy made downstage, but more importantly, it identifies who are the right candidates for a major resection. Uh, pretty much like we did in the series of Mayo. That is patient we are not ideal transplant candidates. Uh, Brian, are you... Uh, can I ask everyone to do other than talking? Uh, Brian, could you comment on your view of imagine for collective genoma? Is this the way to go back? It'll work in better now. I think. I'm sorry, Ryan. We have a question here to uh, uh, Greg. Uh, Greg, you know, I think this question is related to brushing and cytology. So I'm going to ask you, uh, uh, I mean, are there, is there a group of people <coughs> whether it's the diagnosis, whether it's fish or whether it's cytology? And will you at some point say now we should treat them as cholangio? And as a second part, B other question is, is cytology useful for following the outcome of therapy in these patients? Like, can you do cytology and see it's getting better? Yeah, thank you. Um... So just both questions. Um, so the, the diagnosis of perihydrochondrocarcinoma carcinoma <laughs> is, is, requires sort of a gestalt, right? It's not one single piece of the puzzle, but it's rather the composite puzzle uh, that's important for making the diagnosis. So as, as Dr. King uh, nicely showed, if you have a mass and you have a perihylar um, obstruction, uh, this is clangia carcinoma. I've only rarely been fooled, and usually it's been by lymphoma. Um, if you have a vascular uh, encasement, uh, again, that's a malignant situation. And so sometimes the, the cross-sectional imaging studies are quite informative. If you don't have a mass and you don't have vascular encasement, and then you need to exclude IgG4 disease, um, uh, which uh, is, is relatively common, especially in elderly men. And if you can, if you can exclude that, uh, then and your brushings and your cytology are negative, uh, we would rely on the C99 or, or, or progression of the stricture. So the C99 is quite high. We would we would also call that clangia carcinoma or if the stricture is progressing up the ducts. If there's no stricture progression and all the cytology and fish are negative and IgG4 is normal um, and, and there's no mass or vascular encasement, we would follow those patients over time. Um, Thank you. Thank you very much. And I, I don't think that brushings at the t following on treatment are useful because this is a tumor that's also, also outside the bile duct. And, and often you have a stent in there and it denudes the epithelium. So I haven't found the second or third or fourth uh, cytology to be as good as the first. Great. So maybe, so I have here follow up. maybe I have a follow-up question here to, to yeah. Greg. So when we not do, I mean, I, I completely agree that we would not do the brushing on treatment, but what, what is your opinion about um, intraductal therapies? Um, I think we, for, for a time, we used photodynamic therapy then 
some of our colleagues use introductal RFA. So what is your opinion about these introductal therapies, which I think we do not have any good evidence uh, it, when we look at the most recent trials, but it, it still seems to be used by some of our colleagues. Yeah, well, I, I agree with you that um, I, I don't think they're val well validated nor established. Also, I don't think that from a tumor biology perspective that they get enough uh, of, of the depth of penetration to really be useful, that we've abandoned them as well. Great. Yeah. Well, I, I just want to remind everyone, time is limited. We have lots of questions, so I really want everybody to be able to pitch in. Uh, Christine, it's a little confusing. I mean, your talk was just extremely elegant. But how do we decide? Is it PET scan, MRI, CT, uh, all of the above? Like, how, how do you, what is the ideal test? And what is the ideal test for follow up when we actually don't see the tumor shrink? Right. So I think PET CT has a very limited role for perihilar cardio. Uh, um, regarding CT versus MRI, it really is important to find out what type of MRI and what type of CT. So they have to be extremely high quality. A regular, you know, five millimeter portal venous CT is obviously gonna be much worse than an MRI. And a lot of the older studies compared, you know, the old CT versus MRI and CT is always gonna be inferior to that. But if you do high resolution CT at one millimeter cuts with four different phases, you can actually get a higher resolution with MRI with respect to, you know, the soft tissue budding or encasing a partic particular hepatic artery um, or what it's doing to the portal vein, you can see peritoneal implants much better as well. Um, the invasion into the liver, sometimes you can see better. But it's all in either one, it's really important to try to get the imaging before you, any intervention has been done, before the stent's been placed, uh, before any biopsies have been done. We always get information after that, which can sort of obscure things as well. So it depends on the institution and depends on your imaging equipment and what image quality you're able to achieve. So maybe one follow-up question here as well. There was one question regarding the value of uh, PET scan. So can you maybe comment on this to which extent this could be really helpful in the pre-surgery setting, for example, to detect um, extra hepatic or extra ductal metastases? It, so PET scans are helpful for detecting uh, distant disease, for helpful for METs. Uh, for intrahepatic, uh, intrahepatic clangios are often FDG avid. Hyalur clangios are often not. So they're not very helpful for extent of disease or even presence of disease sometimes. Uh, I, I'd say they wouldn't be able to help you define uh, clangio versus an inflammatory stricture because both are going to be similar looking. Um, for intrahepatic, they may be more helpful, and they can be helpful in the recurrent setting after surgery. So we have a couple of questions really for surgeons. Ryan, I don't know if you, your audio is working, but it, it sort of the, brings up the question about, well, when you get chemo and the cancer get worse, in the meantime, while you're waiting for surgery, that arrives that, you know, there is a sense of apprehension. Is this the right thing to do? I'm going to hear me at all now. No. Sorry, Grant. I let uh, Gonzalo or other surgeon comment. Like, Gonzalo, what, what if the cancer gets worse in the meantime? Should the patient not use that? Yes, yeah, sorry about that, Ryan, and I hope uh, I'm responding kind of with a, a similar response. Uh, I mean, I think obviously that is the concern, and that's why I think, you know, the field needs to advance. And probably with the therapies that we have now, you know, it, I understand the risk, and that's why I think it hasn't been widely used. <coughs> As we improve with, with chemo and there's better, you know, understanding of genomic alterations and targeted therapies, and as the results of responses improve, um, that's where, you know, we, we may be able to use these uh, new treatments. And that's why this kind of, you know, panels where there's a combination of surgeons and medical oncologists and hepatologists working together is the key. But I understand the concern, and that's why, Currently, we're not treating everyone with gem cytobin cisplatin because it's a concern that you know patients that are resectable actually may progress. Aren't there questions for chemo that I, I'm going to request you to answer? The yes. About, you know, there's gem cytobin, cape cytobin, there's fall fox, uh, you know, there's gem uh, Patients are not in the US, not treated with Zelora before the transplant. So it's a little confusing. What is the right regimen 
uh, for perihilar. Yeah. And then for before transplant, people are treated with Zalora. What's the, why use that? Please go ahead. Yeah, that's a very, yeah, that's a very good question. And I was about to ask you exactly the same question because I think there really were indeed a couple of questions regarding on the best chemo regimen. And I think it would also be nice to, to hear your opinion about that. So I think today GenSys has been established at the standard of care and first line setting. Um, of course, we would like to improve outcome. Um, PFS is around eight to nine months. Median overall survival in the advanced setting is around one year. So there's certainly room for improvement. One question would be, can we go to a triplet? I think the, the use of Folfirinox or Folfoxiri as in pancreatic cancer um, has been tested by our colleagues in, in France. And the, the phase two study was not very successful, unfortunately. Therefore, they will not continue with the phase three trial. Um, we have seen interesting data for um, Gemsys and Abrexane. So again, the triplet could be an option for really fit patients. And uh, the data that have been published so far would look really um, interestingly. But I think outside of clinical trials, the majority of patients should get a doublet. Personally, I do not think that Xeloda would be the preferred choice. I do think that what we have seen from the very early trial that 5-FU and gemcitabine are equivalent in efficacy, but this were the early days. And I think the doublet was clearly superior to gem alone. And I think this would also be the case for, uh, for Xeloda or 5-FU. Therefore, whenever we think about testing chemo in the new adjuvant, adjuvant setting, I would go for a doublet, and this is what we are doing for in the adjuvant trial, the Actica study in Germany, and uh, we, we are testing whether Gemstis would be superior to Xeloda in the adjuvant setting, and I think that would be the same question in the in the new adjuvant setting. I'm afraid we have time to just one question, and uh, Greg, I'm, I apologize, but the question is also for you. Uh, do you think that ctDNA, CTC, circulating tumor cells? Uh, is this uh, is there role in this? And I apologize for the audience in advance. With the we might just get cut off during the answer, but let's try to get as much as we can. Greg, I think you're muted. You're on mute. You're on mute. Oh, sorry. We have looked at circulating tuber cells, and it was not very useful uh, in early stage disease or minimal disease. Um, but I do think that the cell free DNA. Uh, using epigenetic markers and methylation, um, I think will become a very important tool in diagnosing and monitoring the disease. Uh, Christine, last question is now, I have time for one last question for you, is uh, we have, uh, it's the quality of imaging of critical importance in hyalocholangio. Quality of imaging at this kind of centers that you all are at versus in the community setting. Is, is, does it make a big difference in this cancer? It does, and it does, uh, it will depend on the cancer, it depends on how big the cancer is. So if the cancer is big and ugly, then you know anyone can diagnose it and we know it's not gonna be resectable. It could be a very small cancer that will only be seen on high resolution imaging. And if you have one of those, then it does matter because it may not be seen with a low quality study. Wonderful. I really want to thank all of you for a really a very educational uh, session. I know I've learned a lot and clearly we need this. The number of questions highlights that this is an area that we all need to talk about some more. So I want to thank Arndt for helping me uh, co-moderate this session and all of you uh, really senior authorities on the subject for spending this uh, this morning with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.